Hi everyone, we are back with uh, the final panel discussion before the lunch break, the virtual lunch break. Uh, we are doing uh, an interesting panel discussion, but first I would like to do an introduction about how these past three months may have been. So, up until three months ago, work life was for many as a considered as a routine and involved commuting into work, sending emails, catching up with colleagues and clients in person. But uh, since governments worldwide began mandating for people to work from home in a bit to slow the spread of the novel coronavirus outbreak, uh, this temporary abnormal has seen home becoming temporary offices and many businesses uh, activities have been shifting to online. So as a result, uh, businesses across a uh, myriad of industries, government, retail, finance, real estate, health, education, among several others, have turned to digital tools to support this new way of working. So, on one end of the spectrum, there are organizations deploying technologies for the first time to help cope with the new work environment, and then there are companies that have always relied on such technology, the technology for their uh, uh, tests. So our panelists today come from different backgrounds, but all agree on one important fact, that adoption is the only way forward. So I have with me uh, Konstantina Zafiroska, who is the general manager at IT Labs, a software development company delivering excellence for more than 15 years. Uh, Konstantina began, began her career as an engineer. Since then, she has accumulated over 19 years of experience in the technology industry, uh, focusing the last six years in executive roles. Uh, she leads large teams in a variety of industries, uh, including insurance, finance, and gaming. Uh, Konstantina possesses a unique combination of experience and knowledge in both technology and business and thrives in highly innovative environments. Konstantin, I would like to say hi to everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Glad uh -huh. to be here. So, uh, I also have uh, Makit Nukuhan. Uh, Am I pronouncing that right? <laughs> yes. Who is customer engagement in Bangladesh that brace? Uh, I also met Makit in Prague uh, a couple of months ago at the live conference where I was introduced to the term what is consumer engagement in Bangladesh. So, uh, Magit is an experienced marketing leader with a demonstrated history of working experience in various technology companies, skilled in strategic brand management, uh, brand marketing, brand positioning, digital marketing, digital transformation, and strong media relationships. Uh, after evangelizing and uh, marketing the Sync brand over the last several years, uh, he is now a global evangelist at Brace. Magit, would you like to say hi? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, super excited to be back again. Okay, and last but not least, we have Marek Kopanitsky, uh, who is the uh, consultant at the Slovak Investment and Trade Development Agency, in short, S-A-R-E-O, Sario, uh, with a focus on R&D and innovation. Uh, Sario is a governmental agency working under the auspices of uh, Ministry of Economy of the Slovak Republic. Uh, the mission of the investment projects department is to attract high added value investment to Slovakia and to contribute to regional development of the country. Within its innovation agenda, Sario aims to interconnect Slovak technology firms with big players in Slovakia as well as abroad. Uh, Marek studied economic diplomacy at the University of Economics in Bratislava and international economic and political studies at the Charles University in Prague. Uh, he speaks fluently English, German, and learns also Russian. Uh, in leisure time, he loves reading, traveling, and sports. Hi, Marek. Would you like to say hi to our audience? Hi, sure. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's talk with Nina. Uh, you are a general manager at IT Labs, a company focusing on providing outsourcing services. Could you tell us more about what is the new trend that was somehow pushed by the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah, coronavirus uh, made uh, magnificent, magnificent challenges for all of us, I would say. And um, in general, the 
working aspect uh, was a little bit disturbed and working from home was uh, one of the biggest challenges, I would say. But also what we had experienced is um, how the companies had to transform and what uh, was expected um, to be done by each company and top uh, management and executives in order to make sustainable business. So um, I would say that um, primary challenge in all this was uh, which services will be sustainable, how the business model should be transformed in order to proceed work and survive. And uh, um, I would say that every business had its own journey. And uh, one of the things that, uh, for example, um, was main for us, I would say, in our company, a software development company, obviously, there were no uh, massive uh, need of um, changing the business continuity um, strategy in order to have everyone working from home. Uh, but on another hand, we had um, clients that really needed a help in order to uh, transition from working in office, working in ho at home, and also to transition in, in their services. Because um, many times, I think, um, especially those, uh, and I, I believe here Margit can also uh, give from his experience, but those companies that were a little bit objecting on digital digitalizing services or having digital transformation in the process of um, work, or maybe offering different um, uh, way of, um, of servicing their products, and also adopting some new technologies in their process of uh, either manufacturing or service delivery. Obviously, with a COVID crisis, um, became aware that that is a necessity and that is something that they have to do and transform and make the digital transformation alive. So this, all this um, made, uh, I would say this is like when you put a movie on fast forward, <laughs> um, what we had expected to be maybe something in 2030 or 2040 actually uh, became a reality in 30 uh, days or th three months, right? So um, uh, if 3D printing was not so, let's say, adopted, now 3D printing is kind of uh, very important in um, uh, matching the needs, let's say, for uh, protection, printing uh, ventilators, whatever. Uh, there was so obviously uh, there is big movement uh, that we are all aware of and experiencing daily okay yeah it's a strange time but uh, still a good time for uh, implementing technology so uh let's say i'm a startup company i'm focusing on uh raising funds but now in march i'm hit by this uh, pandemic and i need to switch uh to working from home. So what were the main challenges in March for startup companies when they are started to work from home? Um, I, I think that that was secondary um, challenge. Um, when it comes to, to startups, first of all, it was evident, evidently that destiny of many were determined as they might have been in the wrong industry in the wrong time. Yeah. For example, I had been, um, I have friends who have been developing very interesting uh, um, uh, applications that were for airspace, air travel um, um, sector, and practically they had to put down all their activities and shut down practically. On the other hand, uh, let's say the startups in, in telemedicine, medicine, uh, raise millions in a week uh, time, right? And uh, what, what, what is the, the main, what was the main challenge for startup was the, that they depend on investors. They depend on, on um, financial inclusion uh, for a longer period of time, at least for a year, for example. And what COVID made is that either um, there were uh, all the investment plans were cut or the process was slowed down, which means that the, um, there is the prediction that four out of 10, um, actually statistics that four out of 10 startups had died because they were not able to raise funds. 
And mainly, I would say that uh, there is uh, a, about a quarter of deals for investment, which were kind of agreed through the pre-crisis, uh, you know, uh, which again, it's something that um, uh, shows how unstable the environment became for the uh, for startups. And not really the working from home was a challenge because usually startups are highly um, technology oriented. So I don't think that that was the, the, the problem. But I would say that investment was something that investment process was slowed down massively, at least for 40% of the startups according to the, um, the actual uh, statistics. So, um, and, you know, I think working from home was a cha bigger challenge for bigger companies, uh, those that were not prone to um, have significant digital transformation in their processes, and they had higher difficulties in um, switching from workplace to uh, a home place <laughs> so that they can uh, actually uh, proceed working. And um, um, and one another point for the startup was that according to the to some some statistics, there is between sixty five to seventy five percent of the startups had to um, uh, let go of uh, full time employees, which is significant number. I believe that also, um, as I mentioned previously, uh, the industry where they were, uh, what they were planned were determined based on, on the fact that transportation was down, um, energy also, um, consumer uh, market was uh, absolutely changed, let's say. Um, so obviously the, those startups in, in those areas were a little bit more affected. Those that are in banks, maybe digital currency, uh, telemedicine, um, they are going to see a very fruitful period. Um, and to be honest, when we come to uh, challenges working from home, um, for many was for many employees that was a dream, right? And they, they were thinking that okay, now my dream came true. But taking consideration uh, COVID nineteen and um, different dimensions and, and, and conditions in which you work from home. Um, apparently, wasn't so sweet dream <laughs> kind yeah. of true. Uh, yeah. So uh, obviously, I would say that for the startups mainly, uh, the the domain where they were op trying to operate or trying to build their business uh, was main determinator in this crisis how uh, they could have proceeded or how they can raise money and how how all the process of maturing. Um, uh, it's going to be. Yeah, it was a sweet dream for the first three weeks, maybe a month. But afterwards, when you're seeing that you are working yeah. from home, like you have an office at home now, yeah, which which also leads us to scaling because when this uh, working from home started, uh, we moved all the team to work from home and ourselves as well. So I, I was a bit depressed because when we started the company, we started working from home for two years. So <laughs> we had the office at home and afterwards we just opened an office, hired staff, hired the team. So now it was like moving back, like it's not scaling up, it's just scaling down. So uh, how did the current period influence the scaling of companies? And maybe do you have some examples of some of your partners that you have? Um, I think COVID-19 challenged all the companies and our employees to learn new skills, new technologies, procedures. Uh, nothing can be done as it was done, mm -hmm. right? And considering the whole process was moving us forcefully out of comfort zone, comfort zone. It's not something that we um, just imagine that we now want to change something, right? And, um, uh, and addition to this, um, required really rapid skills conversation with employees, with the, um, maybe even consumers, etc. cetera. And, um, the crisis really made the company management to redefine the processes and make new approach, right? 
and to identify um, what, uh, how the scaling will be, what will be the cost, ma cost management, the revenue management, right? How, how, how the balance between the cost, cost management and new uh, revenue streams will be, will be made. And um, <clears throat> um, I think that the, the need of digital transformation raised during the crisis massively. And uh, the hardcore components of digital transformation of the company processes had been converted uh, into believers, right? And in the last um, uh, several months, uh, turn, they re recognized that in 24 hours, they, they enter recession, right? And now the, the transformation is a must. So um, I believe that transition was very important. And I mentioned earlier through the printing, and I, I'm really fascinated by that, that um, even though 3D printing is in, a, in the industry 4.0 was something that was considered as a, as a boost, as a digital transformation, um, but still um, traditional factors were not able to deliver on time uh, needed equipment and separate uh, and spare parts for production, obviously. And um, uh, COVID helped to see the value of 3D printing and the scaling, what kind of scaling uh, technology can bring to businesses in that point. So um, uh, as, as cases have spiked, like uh, hospital have been uh, running out of the key um, equipment, uh, face shields, ventilators, and uh, traditional factories can, couldn't um, uh, keep up right with that. So uh, we have seen, and I think that there is a lot, a uh, lot of statistics saying how uh, 3D printing innovators have jumped. Um, to help in the process and there are uh, different university laboratories and also entrepreneurs uh, for 3D print uh, sector that have uh, made significant impact and show the world that technology can um, help you scaling, right? Um, and uh, even though some maybe were a little bit skeptical, it has a skepsa there and uh, there were not a dilemma that they were not so uh, um, sure, but obviously um, uh, COVID-19 uh, is turning uh, into a uh, proof point, right? For some of the aspects of, uh, of how technology is used in order to have this uh, uh, scaling. And um, um, if even, even uh, not so developed, uh, let's say countries, um, uh, they had to turn the education, for example, um, from classroom to online oh. and that was massively done in a week time right so um, obviously scaling of the companies of the institutions in the bank system as well you don't go anymore in the bank and all people have to use and there is educational process and learning curve that they have to use online uh, payments and everything uh, instead of going in into the uh, branch office so um I think um, COVID made us aware how technology can help in scaling the business and shortening some of the costs that we thought previously that are must and necessary now are obsolete and absolutely uh, not needed. Uh, and obviously some of the technologies that maybe we considered as a little bit problematic or maybe not so useful are shown that it's it's totally different. Yeah, and uh, technology has enabled uh, life to continue throughout online collaborations and video conferences. There's also ad-driven home delivery, streaming services for entertainment, even for virtual conferencing. Uh, but what about keeping up with projects that have been due in this period? Which uh, How does this whole happening affect the software development companies? I think the software development companies, taking consideration that technology was a must, um, have seen also, depending on the clients, uh, had different challenges because obviously if the client is in the industry that is suffering, the software development company, um, of course, um, uh, uh, feels that uh, effort. But on another hand, um, new businesses, uh, new business model raised, uh, there were new uh, software solution needed, and um, obviously the fast delivery 
it was also a must. You cannot uh, just wait for forming a team six months in order to reconstruct your business model. That was not possible. So obviously, software development companies were the ones that were firstly approached to say, okay, ramp up for me 10 people so that I can transform my business model and ensure that I can keep going. So um, that uh, I think that it's interesting that in, in IT industry, the turnover also is uh, very high um, in, in software development companies, for example, and we understand that the development and quality assurance the guys are um, uh, those that have shorter, uh, let's say, uh, longevity in one uh, one company and they they are just moving from one another but having the crisis the companies had increased demand of um, uh, transformation digitalization and have seen higher loyalty of their employees uh, because the market became unstable and the employees are not so open for changing positions and they find their company in the stable environment during pandemic so um also, what is very important in this period, not only uh, being able to support companies in their process of transformation, either with um, a working from home uh, setup uh, support or um, software development, fast transformation of the processes or uh, some other um, services that are in the whole process of software development from initiation of the project up, up to DevOps and uh, production. Um, what is seen as well uh, is that I had the, uh, the HR department uh, involvement was very high. And um, even though software development companies uh, as well had been strengthening HR departments in the past years due to the need to help the business uh, retain the senior um, technical guys, with COVID, there, is, there was um, obviously need um, to uh, help in sustain in stability of the mental health uh, and while working in quarantine, which is um, um, a condition that is not uh, um, just simply working from home, as we mentioned. So um, transformation of companies in this period of time, as also in the software development companies, uh, actually uh, touched each layer in the company, every segment of the company, and um, um, brought, I believe, different um uh, concept of uh, enabling business uh, continuity and uh, sustainability. Okay, so I have one more final question for, for question for you, but I will leave that after the two guys speak because I see they are falling asleep now. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So, Magi, stepping away from the scale but remaining at the adaptive topic to complement uh, Constantina. Uh, what are the main aspects you realized when working with clients from different industries during this period? You know, the, the first thing that happened was this is a very unexpected circumstance, right? So people on the one side, they were trying to adopt to this new way of life. And on the other side, companies were like trying to adopt to these new ways of life, right? So, I mean, obviously, you know, if you look at uh, different uh, companies, traditional companies, they were not very digital friendly in the beginning, but now, you know, everybody has been like pushed to do this because they have no choice. They have to adopt to these new ways of working. And the first thing that I would like to look at is that on an individual perspective. So what did we do as an individual when this whole thing started? So I would like to bring in the rise of necessity premise. So the first thing when there is a, a pandemic struck, people would think about themselves, right? They have enough food to eat, right? Do, do the paper. Exactly, right? Like, can I take care of myself for the next? Uh, yes, they don't care about anybody else, right? And if you look at uh, in the Google Trends search on the second week of March, specifically second week of March, toilet paper and grocery search went really up and then it came down in the second week of April, right? So people are looking at themselves and the second thing people look at is, okay, I have enough food to eat for the next few weeks, but now safety comes into play. Am I safe? Am my family member safe, right? And then they think about, okay, think about work, right? So how do I now work? How do I engage with my customers? How do I engage with the brands that I have been engaging with for several years? And based on that, people are like adopting in a very fast-paced environment, and obviously that's challenging for brands, right? Because 
almost all of the time, customers are very fast paced into new technology, but oftentimes brands cannot just do that, right? So they were trying to catch up into this new ways of life. So companies have to adopt to these new communication strategies. For example, customer behavior constantly changes, right? Whether it's pandemic or not, but the pandemic, it changes in a very quick span of time. So that's the only difference. So the outgoing CEO of Sainsbury's, which is the largest supermarket, one of the largest supermarkets in the UK, has recently said people are uh, used now to shop online in the last three months. But the pandemic gets over, it just doesn't change because people have found this new convenience, right, sitting at home. And we are talking about different age group of people, right? Oftentimes, they always, always went to the supermarket, but now they have to adopt to, to this new convenience and they like it. And that wouldn't change even after the supermarket opens again, right? So what that means for brands is, how do you engage with them, right? It's not just about acquiring new customers, it's about retaining them. What are the different communication strategies that you employ to retain all of those new uh, customers? And the other thing all the brands should keep in their minds is, um, as human beings, we cannot constantly think of hundreds of brands all the time. When it comes to grocery, we have like three brands in mind. You know, we often go there to shop when it comes to clothes shopping. We have like three other brands when it comes to fitness. We go to one one gym, two gyms we know about, and competition is heavy, right? So if you do not employ those communication strategies, then they think about the other brand, right? So there are like so much thing happened in the last three months. New users growth has gone tremendously, but what do you do to keep them when things goes back to normal? And I think that is really, really true. Yeah, okay, I just realized that you have a guitar on your wall. Oh, yeah, I do, yes. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a show. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, was there a need for some particular technology which has been adopted by companies that deal with B2C clients during this period? You know, I mean, we, we are a customer engagement platform, right? So we help brands to communicate with their customers. So that's what we actually do. And when it comes to adopting to new technologies on a general point of view, companies had to first communicate within the employee groups, right? So they were adopting to virtual communications, trying out Zoom, Zoom right? So Zoom is one of the top most downloaded app in the last uh, a couple of months. And then there are like other apps, for example, everything related to virtual communications, right? So uh, this is one thing that companies have done. And then the second is when things come in at an in, in an unexpected way everybody are like kind of puzzled right so brands needed help to adopt to these new communication strategies as a company we had to really rethink with them in terms of their uh, strategies moving forward right so we had to work with them on a regular basis to see okay we, we see this trend in growing users we see this trend in mobile app users so what can we do to help you to recreate that in a way that you are targeting users in a much more relevant way. When I say relevant, and um, this is key in customer communication, right? So oftentimes you look into an another brand because you just find them find yourself in the position that that the brands that you engage with not taking care about what matters to you the most, right? So for example, imagine staying in a hotel and receiving a push notification at four in the morning asking, are you staying fun? At, uh, are you having fun staying at our hotel? Well, I was, but not anymore. Yeah. When the hell did you send me a push notification at four in the morning, right? So think about these kind of things when that happens all of a sudden in a pandemic in two months time and companies were like not used to that so we wanted we had to help them to you know for different industries so that could be streaming gaming on demand food delivery etc etc to rethink all of their strategies around this new uh, uh, ways of uh, working and also living yeah and uh, during this period fintech was growing is growing at a rapid pace and so is a new term I learned about telemedicine, <laughs> In yeah. the yeah. which was little heard of before the, before the pandemic, uh, and it's really popular now. So, how uh, has the coronavirus pandemic opened the window of acceptance for such yeah. clients? And uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know that's a good question because you know when you when you think of you know 
uh, financial services and fintech brands, oftentimes you can make a relation to this really traditional brands. How often do you think like a, in a digital first bank come into the market? Not quite often, right? So when, when a digital first brand comes, comes into the market, they don't have to worry too much about this pandemic because they are used to this kind of online ways of working and all of their customers, you know, they engage digitally and they honestly, they don't even have like a bank bank, so to speak, as a physical location in most of the cases. And as Nina mentioned, it doesn't, the banks have been closed, but still people have to bank in some or the other way. People have to, you know, uh, pay for the services that they use. People have to pay rent. People have to send money to their families, et cetera, et cetera. So what we saw uh, in, 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 uh, in April this year compared to last year, there has been the user growth doubled for the financial services. But the interesting aspect is that mobile usage went up by around 14.65%, right? So that is really key in how people engage with brand. And for me, this is kind of like a digital transformation also for companies. And traditionally, all of these users, they literally walk into a bank to get their things done. But now that has changed. Again, you know, bringing in convenience, right? So do people go to the bank when things get open or do they use the digital services? And again, for fintech industries, what they have to really keep in mind is that to serve these customers on a regular basis, even after when things open up. And what does that really mean for the customer relationship that you had something completely different before and what do you have uh, now? And, you know, the main cost for that is, of course, um, all of these banks were like closed and there has been an economic financial volatile so people were like trading in stocks and the stock market came down you know on the 22nd of march the so people had to quickly get onto uh, mobile phones to see how there is a big trend and how they are being affected because you know people are worried about money all the time so the food money and then you think of work and then you think of your extended family and friends and um so this is this is the way that people think and companies have to adopt to it yeah i, I think revolut was a big winner in this we, we are not making any advertisement but i saw that their growth was huge and yeah. it was something like a marketing that they did that you had to make the smallest amount of clicks to open an account at Revolut than any other online bank. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have one more question for you, which I will leave after Marek. <laughs> yeah. So, Marek, it is a room. It is a rumor that uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic has accelerated ten key technology trends and has demonstrated the importance of digital readiness. But there, there is a case also in which it created a massive uncertainty in global capital flows. So what is the role of foreign digital investment, FDI, when we are addressing this topic for local companies seeking investment? Mm, yes, yes, Zoltan. Thank you. Thank you for this question. And maybe I will try to give some macro view to the previous discussion. And also, thanks to thanks to this question, yes, you are right that it's believed that in the business of foreign direct investments, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will strongly accelerate free pre-existing trends. First of all, we were already speaking of technology adoption. It means 5G network, it means robotization, automation, digitalization, industry 4.0 solutions. Secondly, uh, it will support sustainable practices, meaning uh, green and clean tech solutions and renewable energy resources, etc. And very importantly, in our business, it will also accelerate the supply and value chains reconfiguration. It means that they, the supply and value chain will be more localized and more diversified after the crisis. And this topic will, we will surely debate later on. So speaking of the first one of the importance of digital readiness and acceleration of the technology adoption uh, in new corporate investments within countries as well as across the borders, it's now more than ever before important to focus on growth sectors which skyrocketed during last month. And you mentioned a few of them before e-commerce, fintech, medtech, life sciences, obviously, 
but also gaming or, or cybersecurity. And there is no doubt that these together with more industry 4.0 principles in industry sector and automation and, and digitalization in services, this is the way for all companies where to go and the sectors which to invest in. So this crisis has clearly shown us all that the new technologies are not some night plus or, or long term possibility, but it's a big must in our, our uncertain times. And this shift um, as such represents a very difficult homework for, for all important stakeholders from innovators, business leaders, but at the end of the day, also, also our political leaders and, and governments. Yeah, and, and, and all over the world, foreign investors are navigating in uncharted waters right now. So what would your advice be for them, uh, especially given the opportunity to drive forward uh, some of the most awaited technology, which was maybe put on pause for a while? Yes, yes, COVID-19 outbreak and the pandemic put the brakes on the future and potential foreign direct investments, but it didn't stop them altogether. A recent survey, I found the numbers by uh, Ernst and Young estimated that overall 66, it means two thirds of companies expect a decrease in their original 2020 investment plans. And only 11% of businesses do not expect any change. So it's visible in many other areas of our lives, the conditions and the figures will not come back to the pre-crisis values and, and figures this year, maybe not even next year. For instance, in, in aviation or automotive or travel business, it may take uh, long years until the turnovers and the profits of the biggest companies and leading players will be back uh, at, the, at the figures from 2019. A road to recovery maybe, maybe will be long, will be difficult and slow and uh, we still cannot forget that it might be interrupted by possible second or, or further waves of, of COVID-19 outbreak. So obviously an FDI sector is not an exception and currently it's still hard to estimate how many successful investment projects will be concluded this year, how many new FTEs will be established. On the other hand, the question is also how many FTEs will be lost, right? Yeah. Uh, during downsizing by, by many companies. So the business simply stopped, disappeared for a couple of weeks and this shock traveled and it's still traveling from Asia to Europe, throughout the US. Now we know that the Latin America, Brazil is uh, suffering the most. So this all disrupted global supply chains and no one can predict when and whether at all they will uh, recover. So my personal advice, if you are asking, will uh, will follow maybe a well-known cliches. The first one is that every crisis creates an opportunity time and a challenge. And the second is that the successful ones are not the reasons, but the successful ones are those who can quickly adopt to a new reality, to a new normal, so to speak. So again, faster adoption of modern technologies more sustainable and green solutions and the last but not least also a localization of, of supply chain will be important so so in your country in slovakia most probably all around the central and eastern european countries uh digitalization process has started and uh, we can say it was accelerated during this period and what can you say about this acceleration of adoption Yes, yes, you are right. As in uh, in Slovakia, in uh, our CEE region, Central and Eastern European region, but all around the world, at the end of the day, uh, a digitalization process has started. What is confirmed also also by the numbers that the digital and business service sectors attracted most foreign direct investments last year in 2019. It was 31 percent of new projects and 24% of new jobs created last year was created thanks to digital and business services sectors. So, so departing and then starting from here, uh, the digitalization across industries, but also across public services will accelerate further. And it is caused by both displacement of low skilled workforce due social distancing. And uh, secondly, it's simply cheaper. It's simply more effective way of working with minimal social interactions with less traveling and less personal meetings so so by the way this event is a nice example of it right we were we should have been meeting somewhere in Tallinn or I don't know where 
uh, at the beginning of May. Yeah. And now you see, we are doing it uh, virtually and it's cheaper and that hopefully is also more effective. We'll, we'll see according to reactions of our listeners. So, and if I still may, there is one more sector, which is very interesting next to the digitalization and that's the clean tech sector. It has been one of the key drivers of the FDI market for many years now. Uh, and very strong growth was there also in 2019, last year. But this crisis has dramatically reduced the demand for conventional energy sources, and especially in the areas with high pollution, I mentioned automotive or, or in aviation. So so-called clean solutions with renewable energy resources are becoming relatively more important as a source of energy. And uh, there is a strong economic rational or economic aspect behind that also, because this clean, clean energy projects are typically very capital intensive and they require also continuous R&D, continuous technological advancements. So definitely this is the way where to where to look forward and uh, where this whole business will go in a year. Yeah, I see we're running out of time. We only have nine minutes, but with a short uh, answer for this one, uh, that in this temporary abnormal, the winners will be those governments that pioneer novel ways to help investors. So in a world where prosperity remains depending on the open economic quarters, what are the steps taken by Sario to ensure that these facts are met? Yes, yes, I will try to be short and, and the succinct as, as, as I can. Um, and that's correct. One of the key factors which will drive the recovery of FDIs in every investment destination is a confidence of investors in the containment of COVID-19 and opening up again for, for business. So uh, when it comes to COVID-19 containment, Slovakia is considered to be a great success story with only 28 victims so far. And at the moment, there are only 100 active cases in Slovakia. There is increase of two persons every day. So, so we can say that, that, that it was really a success story, but only the first first part of the success story, because now, like in any all other EU countries, now the discussion is focused more on opening borders, opening economy and rescuing the whole economy life. So here you were asking about Sario, our role at the Slovak Investment and Trade Development Agency as an investment promotion agency is besides attraction of new investments to intensify our support and our existing services for established companies in a free ways, very, very quickly. First time is a uh, aftercare services, so it means post investment support, explaining already adopted support schemes and financial mechanisms to firms, and discussing uh, potential expansions of them or localization of suppliers. I mentioned before because these suppliers were and still are located abroad. Secondly, is the innovation services. You mentioned it in my bio, it's the interconnecting or matchmaking the needs of large investors established in Slovakia with competencies of the most innovative Slovak technology companies, automation, predictive maintenance, digital factory solutions in industry and software automation, cybersecurity, AI or big data in services of sector or, or yes, in a sector of services. And, and thirdly, diversification services towards e-mobility, space and aviation sectors through which we aim at the diversification of Slovak economy towards promising high-tech areas. So I try to be as, as uh, concise as possible. And these are the ways and these are the steps uh, which, which our agency um, took to ensure that, that these facts will be, will yes, be met. Yes. Thank you so much, Marek. I will head back to Konstantina now. Uh, so, Konstantina, how is IT Labs helping its partners in such times? And, and what are your suggestions for those companies that have never considered partnering uh, with an outsourcing service uh, to look for now? Um, obviously, there is, um, in the last uh, months, as we all uh, recognize, the need of transformation. So, uh, the capacity that we are um, giving to our uh, clients and the companies that approach us in this period is to help them um, make that digital vision into practice, into reality. So uh, obviously not every company has capacity internally or in this um, 
process of fast transformation and the need to really transform the business model, not always the internal capacity is sufficient because um, you know there is always the prioritization that has to be made. So we help them with additional personnel uh, to speed up that process and to really um, beat the time, let's say, in their transformation and really um, lower the loss of revenues that uh, was caused by this uh, pandemic. And um, obviously the company uh, never outsourced. Uh, it is always a challenge how to choose their vendor, how to, uh, who is the, the right vendor to, uh, uh, to be the partner. And um, I would say uh, uh, very strictly, um, if you never outsourced ever in your life, uh, just see um, who is the reliable partner that can be with you in good and bad. What that means, it has capacity to support you, even though when you don't have a vision, even though when you don't have internal capacity to lead that transformation, but someone that can really live with your vision and throughout the, the challenging times. So that is the trustworthy and uh, reliable partner that you should look for instead of um, going up to price or maybe um, who is close to you because now uh, doesn't matter where the person is, everyone is from home. So <laughs> location doesn't matter. Uh, okay, thank you, Lina. Uh, so, Maggie, uh, how do the numbers look like now at Praise? Because I've seen that uh, top global brands are sending tens of billions of messages per month to over 2.1 billion monthly active users via your company so has this doubled during the pandemic just a quick answer please yeah so, you know, i mean we analyzed more than 1000 brands and you know with 2.3 billion monthly active users worldwide but one of the key thing here is you know we see like specific industries taking off for example on-demand food and beverages we saw a surge in new user acquisition growing by 95 percent this year and for gaming we saw 78.5 percent but the winner here is education and ad tech which is grown by a whopping 270 wow. percent and 97 uh, percent of the new users using mobile apps so the winner is education but we see like a trend going up in across the industries Wow, big numbers. So, Marek, one final question for you. Uh, do you think that uh, deglobalization, which is now happening, is, is impacting free flows of FDI? Just also a quick answer, please. Your microphone is muted. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yes, definitely it is. And uh, it should not be inherently negative, however, because uh, you remember I mentioned this uh, reconfiguration of supply chains, and it's understandable that this process will support the regionalization of value chains, which inherently works against the globalization. Uh, but from the perspective of large corporations which are investing, this all should reduce risk to being too dependent on one key particular region or one factory or one country at the, at the end. So they will surely strengthen their preferential relationships to their key suppliers and will try to have them as close as, as possible. But overall, I believe that these multinationals will not become any less global as a result of this trend of this COVID-19 pandemic and deglobalization. They will just distribute their, their activities and processes more reasonably and more effectively uh, around and efficiently around around the globe. Yeah, so, that's, so there were a lot of things that we talked about today, and uh, I would like to thank my uh, panelists. Anyone would like to maybe add a thirty-second closing word? If I was the last, I just want to thank you all for 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 this uh, happening and then for having us. I mean, it was it was excellent opportunity for all of us. And thank you. And hopefully we will meet uh, one day also in person and not all virtually. Yeah. <laughs> Nina, I would say stay safe and take care, and hope to see you somewhere on a coffee where we can drink real coffee, not virtual. Exactly. Maggie? Same from my side too. You know, stay safe everyone. Looking forward to meeting all of you soon.